Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. My name is Dara Shaw. I'm a senior public engagement associate at Public Agenda. Thank you so much for spending your Wednesday afternoon with us, if that's where what your time zone is within. Um, and for those of you that have already introduced yourselves in the chat, thank you so much. Um, and then for those of you who haven't, we're just asking you to share your name, where you're located in your organization and your role. Um, and so a little bit of housekeeping before we go ahead and get started. So as you can see, we're sharing our um, we're sharing a presentation today. If you'd like to see the presentation more than faces, there is a rectangular silver rectangle that you can click on and move to the left or right to toggle between seeing more presentation versus seeing more faces. Um, and yeah, so today we'll have some dialogue for about um, 50 minutes and then a couple of minutes at the end for questions. If you have questions during the presentation, you can feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end. And with that, I'll invite Andrew, our president, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Dara. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever time it is for folks to everybody. And thank you so much for taking some time to join us today. Uh, the fact that you're here means that you already know a little bit about Public Agenda since we only invited uh, close friends of the organization. But I still wanted to take just a few moments to say a bit about who we are as a way of leading us into the research that, this, that is the focus of today's conversation. And so to that end, I wanted to start by reading you a brief paragraph from a background document on public agenda. It's actually a draft version, but I'll just read this to you. This is a time of frustration in American life. Many Americans believe that they have no effective voice in shaping the decisions that affect their lives and those of their children. Seeing themselves as no more than onlookers to important policy debates on energy, inflation, unemployment, economic growth, and foreign policy, the public responds to its leaders with skepticism, apathy, and increasing mistrust. So that was written in 1979, and with a few adjustments could probably have been written yesterday. And that's evidence, I think, of public agenda's longstanding focus on voices that are not being heard in American public life, and especially the gap between those empowered to make decisions that are binding on all of us and the great majority of people who do not have and don't feel they have access to those decision makers. We've been fighting what may be a rear guard action uh, in support of a stronger and healthier and more inclusive democracy for the last 50 years. And uh, this, this work continues for reasons we all know about and has as particular salience right now. Our contribution is to undertake research and practical engagement to understand the needs, the goals, the aspirations and values of ordinary Americans, and to create opportunities for the voices of ordinary people to make a difference, both in the institutions of democracy itself and in the key institutions that shape participation opportunities for real people, such as healthcare and educational institutions. And so we're very pleased to have the opportunity to share with you this latest piece of research focused on Americans who are alienated from the political process. And we're interested in this group for a few reasons. One is, as I indicated, our core purpose is to surface unheard voices and those who feel disconnected from political processes. And, and so this work looks at them directly uh, and hears from them directly. Second reason is that in various surveys we've done on a range of topics in recent years, the presence of large groups of Americans who feel disconnected either from our political parties in their current form or from the political process as a whole, we've been struck by the, the size of these groups. And so we want to understand better who these folks are and what matters to them. And finally, at times of great stress on political systems, one question that can matter a lot in the outcome is the proportion of the citizenry who feels genuinely invested in our existing institutions. So in the United States, we're in such a period right now. And so the question of whether a sufficient number of Americans will be ready to stand up and fight for our institutions, it's not an academic question. And so we wanted to understand not only how many Americans are alienated from our politics, but also 
who these folks are at a deeper level, what they care about, what they want to see happen, and what, at least from their perspective, might bring them more actively into the political process and into engagement and, and more confidence in the possibility of their, their feeling themselves as being heard and relevant to outcomes. So that's what the project is about, and to share uh, a bit about the survey we did and what we have learned from it, I will turn it over now to David Schleifer, Public Agenda's Vice President and Director of Research. Great, thank you. Um, so you, what we did in this survey um, uh, was to try to find out how many Americans are political alien, politically alienated. Um, we asked them how much they agreed or disagreed with three statements, um, which you can see here on your screen. So uh, one is about people's external efficacy. So how much politicians care about what they think. One is about their trust in politicians and particularly their trust in politicians to put the interests of the country ahead of the interests of, the, of their party. Um, and then the third question that we used was about internal efficacy. So people's degree of understanding of politics. And, and we adapted the questions from some previous research that's been done on the British electorate. If we go to the next slide, uh, we're going to ask you some of these questions, and I'll, I'll let Vera lead you through that. Thanks, David. So a poll will be popping up on your screen, and we're going to ask you, which do you agree or disagree with? Politicians don't care what people like me think. Politicians in Washington cannot be trusted to put the interests of the country ahead of the interests of their party. And the last statement, politics and government seems so complicated, I can find it hard to understand what is going on. So if you agree with one of the statements, you would select one. If you would agree with two, you would select two, all three, you would select all three. And if none, then you would click none. And we'll give folks a second to answer. All right, so it looks like 56% or half of the people here are saying more than half are saying that they agree with two of these statements. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting. And I'll pass it back over to David to talk about what does that look like in the research that we did. Right, so um, what you can see on the next slide is what we found when we surveyed a representative sample of Americans on these three questions. Uh, which is that nearly one in three Americans agreed with all three of the statements that we had asked um, and are politically alienated based on this, this measure. Um, and um, one of the things that's that's I was actually interesting is they're 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 fairly evenly distributed across political affiliations, not perfectly, um, but um, they are fair, you know, there's not a huge difference between political affiliations here. So, you know, I think which, it, which is important because this is this this alienation is not just a Democratic or Republican or even an independent phenomenon. So if we can look at the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about some findings, first of all, about Americans overall, and then we'll loop back to uh, these alienated populations. So one of the things that we asked in this survey and that we have asked in previous years um, is about how people think our democracy is doing. And what you can see here uh, on the far right of your screen, the, the 2022 findings, is that half of Americans now think our democracy is in crisis. And actually another 44% think it is facing serious challenges. Only 6% of Americans think our democracy is doing well. And as I said in a moment, we'll, we'll see how the alienated folks respond to this. But I think you know, these findings are, are quite striking. We have seen some change in this over time. 
uh, from when we started asking this 2018. Thanks, David. So Andrew, can you tell us a little bit more about what does this mean? We're seeing significant change from 2018 to now. Um, what does that mean, given what we know about Americans and thinking about the level of crisis and risk? Yeah, I think, you know, I think for me, again, this, this provides a useful backdrop for understanding where politi politically alienated Americans fit in or could fit in. And so obviously this is kind of the views of the public on things. They're, they're, people can have their own views about what kind of the objective reality is, et cetera. But, but it is notable, as David said, this has increased just in the last few years since we did some surveys on this. Uh, it is also the case that th I think this question, it's hard to find uh, lots of history on this going back much further. But when you look at related questions from like the American National Election Survey about how satisfied people are with the functioning of, the, of American democracy, it's just gotten people's perceptions of how things are going have gotten much, much worse. So if we sense that people feel that way now, we're not wrong. In the mid 1990s, when I think a lot of us wouldn't look back on that as a halcyon time in American life, the vast majority of people thought that American democracy was doing pretty well. And so something has changed fundamentally. And if we think that people's perceptions of this may reflect something real going on in the country, then again, understanding how different groups of Americans fit in, the degree of system loyalty that people have, that they feel that the system ultimately is what's important, regardless of the views of their party, et cetera, these things may turn out to be quite significant. And so for me, again, it's kind of why all this matters. Thanks. And you know, I'm a definitions person. So a little while ago, our organization did some level setting on definitions around big terms that we use all the time. Um, and so I know that the definition of democracy in here is a little bit different than what we might have talked about previously, but can you kind of contextualize both? What are we talking about when we say democracy here and maybe a little bit what we're talking about internally too? Yeah, I think what's interesting is, um, you know, again, the, the higher your bar for democracy, presumably the more likely you are to think it's in trouble, the more you ask of it, the more you might think it's falling short. And so, uh, you know, this question gave a definition for people, and it's quite a minimal version, right? A, a democracy where citizens have a voice, rights are protected, laws are fairly enforced. That seems like a pretty minimal conception of democracy. And even in that context, the vast majority of Americans now think either we're in crisis or we're facing serious challenges. So I think that's useful to understand. And again, I think like for us at Public Agenda, we would set a much higher bar and seek a democracy in which there's a much deeper level of connection between the policies that are pursued, the way institutions function and the real interests and needs, aspirations of ordinary people. And so I think if you if you have high hopes for democracy, you might even be more pessimistic. But even this question of just whether the system is sustainable, uh, you know, at that very minimal level, we, we see a lot of skepticism about that among the public. Yeah, and in addition to asking people if we think that democracy in crisis, we wanted to understand a little bit more about the design and structure of our nation's government and their opinion on it. So before we share those results with you, we're going to ask you in the audience with another polling question what your thoughts are. So the question is, is the design and structure of our nation's government A, fine as long as we elect the right people to represent us, or B, insignificant, in need of significant change no matter who we elect? We'll give you a few moments to respond. And James, I see your question in the chat. I think we might be able to answer that in the presentation, but we will get to it at the end if we don't. <laughs> All right, thank you. So what we're seeing is that the majority of people here um, are saying that the design and structure are in need of significant change no matter who we elect. And I'll pass it over to David to talk more about what we saw in the mm -hmm. research as well. Right. Um, so what you can see here is that from our most recent survey, um, just a few weeks ago, um, 
56% of Americans say that the design and structure of government, of government needs to change. And again, this is up uh, 14 percentage points from when we first asked this question in 2019. So there's a growing uh, share of Americans who think we need this more fundamental structural change. And if we actually go to the next slide, um, we can talk about um, our alienated folks. So um, if we compare just the people who are alienated to people who are not alienated, um, we can see that far more alienated people think that our democracy is in crisis. And also far more of them think that we need this fundamental um, restructuring of the, 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 the design and structure of government needs to change no matter who wins in an election. Um, and I think Andrew, you were gonna um, sort of reflect on this a little bit and, and, and why this matters and, and maybe how this relates to some of the public agenda's previous work, particularly on polarization. Yeah, I think there's a couple interesting things, again, that are just uh, at least suggested or worth thinking about in the context of this data. So one is, you know, I think we we have a tendency to think about politically alienated people, particularly because there's the question in the index that is about, you know, it's also confusing. I just don't know uh, how to make sense of it. We might think of them as sort of paying no attention, apathetic, thinking everything's fine. I don't need to pay attention. But that's actually not the view of the folks who identified, who answered those, those three questions to kind of qualify as politically alienated. They see a crisis and they see it at higher levels than the you know respondents in general in the survey. So that's that's one thing that just stood out to me that an, an image of people as sort of float, floating through life thinking I don't need to pay attention to politics. That's not quite right if that's what we're imagining. The other thing that just starts to take shape, and I think some of the other uh, responses you know we can think about in this context, and it'd be an interesting thing to talk more about at the end is. You know, I think for many people, the problem they see right now in America is polarization. That's obviously gotten a lot of focus. And, you know, in many ways, polarization clearly is a problem in many of its manifestations. But I think one of the things, like we did a study on affective polarization. So just basically the degree to which people don't like or have negative emotional feelings about people with different partisan identities. And, you know, it turned out that about 30% of the public says that they don't like people of the other party, which means 70% of people didn't say that. And it seems to me that, you know, and again, the numbers are higher among more engaged people and more who tend to be more partisan. So for the vast majority of people who are not as engaged in politics, they don't feel really high levels of anger and hatred toward people of the other party. And they, what they seem to be suggesting is that things aren't working well and that they want to see structural change. And I guess that's, for me, one of the big points for us to think about is, should we be focused on depolarization as such, maybe necessary to depolarize, maybe necessary to depolarize, maybe more among the more engaged, but, but maybe we should be thinking about these structural questions and whether, I saw Jim's comment, whether that's about simply restoring the effective functioning of our constitutional norms, whether that's about changing systems and processes, there's probably a lot of approaches, but it's different from just thinking about the question of are people getting along with each other? And so I think some of this research just helps redirect us toward questions that maybe aren't getting sufficient focus currently. Yeah, and that's a great segue into, we did a little bit of work under understanding what are the seriousness of different problems that people are commonly saying is the issue with democracy. Um, David, can you tell us a little bit more about what that seriousness looks like? Yeah, um, so um, what we did here was we, we asked about a range of central problems that people might perceive um, in our democracy, um, and there's a lot more detail uh, in the, the report, of course, but I just want to highlight a few themes here. So um, two thirds of Americans do think it's a serious problem that politicians are more interested in blocking the other side than in getting things done. Um, we also saw um, in the two, the, the two pink bubbles in the bottom, um, relatively high degree of concern about corruption 
um, and about government being controlled by corporations and the wealthy. Um, I think that um, I'm not, you know, I, I think, and, and we, we, we asked that question because it is the, the, those concerns about corruption and, and government being sort of captured by, um, by, wealthy, by, by wealthy people and corporations. It's something that we hear in focus groups a lot. I think it really reflects one of the things that we often hear qualitatively that people are concerned about. And here you can see um, that the, these are the, among the things that, that rise to the top as, um, as the, the most, among the most serious problems. Um, and you know, back to our alienated friends, um, alienated Americans see all of these problems as more serious than non-alienated Americans. Um, they, they don't put them in different order, but they, um, they think everything is just, just more serious. Yeah, I think this data is super interesting. I know personally, a lot of my assumptions are being challenged when we think about the level or the order of which the seriousness of these different problems are. And I wanted to hear a little bit more from you, Andrew, on what are some of the connections or themes that you're making, or even just overall, what is um, an, an analysis of what the seriousness means for these different types of problems? Yeah, I think, again, that it's interesting that, uh, you know, so first of all, the, the idea that politicians are more interested in blocking the other party than getting anything done. I think, you know, one thing we should be thinking about is kind of what is the dynamic of polarization and where does it matter? So the fact that, again, you know, polarization in Congress, for example, I think I think it's fair to say preceded the, the polarization we've seen in the electorate. And it may be that we ought to be thinking of the polarization in the electorate as a symptom uh, of, of that you know, polarization in our institutions. And that, that, again, that reframes how we think about it. And again, some symptoms need to be treated, right? Symptoms can kill you, but they're not the underlying disease. And so I think uh, trying to sort that out. And again, we can't in this one survey, uh, you know, unspool precisely the relationships among these things. But I think it gives us a sense that, you know, there's a group of Americans who see the level of battling among those who they think are controlling things, and they don't totally understand it as being the problem. And it causes them to feel like the whole thing is out of control and that that there's a crisis unfolding, again, that they don't feel like they understand necessarily, but they want to see it end. And I think we see some evidence for that in the data as well. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that, you know, I think, you know, across the surveys that we've done over the past few years about divisiveness and common ground, what we've pretty consistently seen um, is a greater degree of concern um, about, about divisiveness between leaders, um, lesser degree, not none, but lesser about divisiveness between individuals. And I actually, we can pretty consistently see that, that most Americans think that the degree of divisiveness has been actually overstated by leaders in the media. And, and, and again, I, you know, I think about focus groups who've done on this where actually people will often say that divisiveness is being strategically overstated as a sort of distraction um, that is being sort of ginned up um, at, to sell newspapers um, and also kind of distract folks from some of the other things that that might be the sense that there's other stuff that's going on behind the scenes and all the divisiveness talk is to some extent a distraction. Not, not entirely, but I do think it's important when we talk about divisiveness to um, differentiate between uh, divisiveness between leaders and divisiveness between regular ordinary people. And just one part of that, I think, you know, people see the divisiveness among leaders as being part of the way they're excluded from the process. So that, again, that question about, you know, politicians care more about winning battles against the other party than about uh, what I think about or care about, et cetera. So I think there's a connection between those things. The sense of voicelessness and not being heard in the political process is connected to the nature of the divisiveness at the top. But again, as David just said, it's not that people feel extreme animosity toward their neighbors with whom they don't agree on everything, which again, I think is sometimes the way this issue gets framed uh, in public presentations of it. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of agreement with that in the chat as well. Julia's saying that's great to hear 
that many Americans understand the roots of divisiveness. Chris is also saying the media and social media in particular thrive on driving the narrative of a divided country. So seeing agreement in the audience as well. Um, and of course, all of this information is really helpful, but you know, one of our goals at Public Agenda is thinking about how can we remove barriers to um, having our systems be accessible by many and having those and seeing who we can engage with in order to build a healthier and stronger democracy. So um, I'll pass it over to David to talk about what it'll take to get people more involved in our politics. Right. Um, so um, if we look at, yeah, so um, and this actually, I think, goes to a question that Jim had had in the chat, which is sort of what is what does um, structural change look like, or what, what could it look like? Um, and and you know, in the the way that we frame this particular question that I'm going to show on this slide and the next is we you know we asked about a broad range of things that could get people more involved in the political process, not in vo voting specifically, um, but in the political process more generally. We asked about some structural reform ideas like term limits, um, more standardized process for drawing voting districts, a few other things along those lines. We also asked about some kind of bigger picture, you might call it ideas, um, uh, like ordinary people having more of a voice in government decision making, um, politicians working together despite their differences, um, and politicians just acting on voters opinions, basically just heeding the agenda of the public. Um, and, um, you know, I think one takeaway here um, um, is that, you know, politically alienated people are, are more likely to say that basically everything that we asked about um, would get them more involved in the political process compared to their, their non-alienated peers. Um, and certainly some of the things that rose to the top in terms of what would get people more involved were these things like, you know, people having more of a voice in decision making um, and politicians actually listening to and acting on, on what voters have to say. Um, <clears throat> and we can see a little bit of this on the next slide as well, um, where, you know, these are some of the more sort of structural reforms. Um, you know, and, and, you know, yes, there are substantial numbers of people who are saying we could get them a great deal more involved. This is a great deal. But actually, if you, you go back to that previous slide, um, you know, there's a, a somewhat of an edge um, for, uh, particularly for the, the alienated folks on some of these things, like just people having more of an influence on government, government decision making as one of the things that would motivate people to get involved. Um, and actually, um, Dara, I was going to, hoping you could say a little bit more about what that might look like. What, what would it mean for people to have more of a voice, get more involved um, beyond just voting? And, and um, you know, maybe you can say a little bit more about public engagement, uh, public agendas work to facilitate greater voice, greater involvement. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, the framing is really important too. So we always talk about how people don't feel like they have a voice. Sometimes the word voicelessness is used. And I think sometimes in that framing, the onus gets put on the individual to just try harder. Um, when we know that individuals are trying harder, you know, sure, there's always that element, but really what are our systems? Are our systems actually accessible to the needs of individuals who are wanting to participate but can't always participate. And so when we think about um, engagement, we're thinking about engagement in all aspects of the democratic process, not necessarily just voting, but what are the ways that you can get involved in community boards, school boards, um, and also what are the barriers to getting involved in community boards and school boards? For example, do you work in the evenings and you can't make a school board meeting? Um, is the community board meeting super far from where you work or where you live? Um, there's all these different barriers to access that we're thinking about. Um, but in one really good example of a way that we're thinking about accessibility for um, particularly people who are often having these large barriers to participating in the democratic process is participatory budgeting. And so we've been working with the New York City Civic Engagement Commission to look at how can we create equitable processes within participatory budgeting as a whole. And so participatory budgeting for those that don't know is a way that um, citizens can essentially vote and have control over a small portion of the city's budget. And so the idea is that 
residents will be able to create ideas and generate ideas based off of issues that they see in their neighborhood. Those ideas then get voted on by a majority. And so even within that process, that sounds great, right? But there's already accessibility issues within that process. For example, who has the technology to be able to come up with those ideas? Who has the time to be able to come up with those ideas? Is that app equitable and resourceable? How, how do people find out about this process? And so we've been working really closely with the New York City Civic Engagement Commission to think about ways that we can bring different accesses um, to the different processes. And so one example is the idea generation phase, which is a new process, but there is an idea generation phase where um, that idea is initially generated by a group of people. And so what New York City is doing right now is working specifically in neighborhoods that have low levels of involvement in the initial participatory budgeting process to work with them to think about how can we create new ways to generate ideas that might not require an app or a computer or a phone. So that's just one example. I just wanted to say in that context, because I was, I was also seeing some of the conversation in the chat uh, that Parisa and Chris were involved in about, you know, the distinction between sort of leaning on individuals to make change or big systemic change. And I think part of what we're saying, and I think this also may be what Chris was, was referencing, uh, is there's a kind of intermediate possibility, which is change at the local level, where we're not, you don't need a national constitutional amendment, you don't need giant legislation, et cetera, but processes that can be, you know, some citizens getting together and advocating can make some changes in governance. And I think, you know, part of, for me, like connecting up these dots, the idea that, people feeling like they have a greater sense of participation and control so that, it, you know, which we can create maybe if, as Dara was saying, we build processes where people feel like their voice can really get in the mix, that may make a difference in the extent to which they feel like this is a democracy that actually works for me and matters to me. They may still feel like at the federal level, things are a little bit a mess, but it could be experientially different if there are opportunities at the local level. Uh, and many of these reforms have at least, uh, there's ways to think about them as happening at a scale that's that's maybe achievable by ordinary people working together. Yeah, and that reminds me a lot of the prison system role framework, which is something that we use when we think about systemic change, that often systemic change is really difficult to achieve. Like, you know, we just did a program trying to do systemic change around health equity in six different states in two years. Uh, we found out systems change doesn't happen in two years. So big lessons learned there. Um, but what was important is thinking about the person role system framework is that people uphold systems, right? So we have roles within different aspects of different types of systems. And so being able to think about ways within the power that we hold that we can create greater access and remove barriers is another way to bring it more locally, individually, and organizationally as well. Great, okay. Brittany is saying, totally agree. And I've seen in focus groups that once someone participates once, they are much more likely to stay involved and have the confidence to participate more in bigger ways. Absolutely. Great. All right. Um, so I think we can move on to answering any questions. So we're going to ask people, um, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, or if you're feeling brave, you can use the raise hand function under the reactions um, so that we can see you and you can ask your question out loud. And I might say, so there were a few questions I think that showed up in the chat earlier, which I think would be for David. So I saw Jim asked some questions about, I'm trying to remember where it was, but about partisan differences. This may have been on, uh, I think it was on the identification of the seriousness of various problems, et cetera. Um, but it might be interesting to know, David, kind of what we know about the partisan differences, uh, both maybe among the general public, among the alienated folks, et cetera, in both those problems and also their responses to different solutions. Uh, right. So um, I think it's a, uh, um, there's variation. I feel like it's such a researcher when I say that. Um, but, I, you know, when we talk, you know, certainly when we look at the problem statements, um, for the most, and what I have in front of me happens to be the, the alienated Democrats versus the alienated Republicans. And for the most part, there was not tremendous difference um, between, uh, between alienated folks by 
party ID, but there were differences on some questions, um, such as a um, question about um, elections being stolen, um, more Republicans than, than Democrats who were alienated um, saw that as a serious problem. Um, and then when we looked at the, at the um, solutions, um, again, I would say um, there's, there, there's variation. I mean, I think for a lot of the solutions, there is a fair degree of cross-partisan agreement um, on, we'll say, would get them more involved. Um, but it's 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 not across the board, and and you know so there were some some of the structural things that we asked about were actually where we saw well let me put it a different way some of the kind of those big picture things like people having more of a voice politicians eating um, eating what ordinary folks have to say I mean that's where we see tremendous cross partisan agreement um, we did see more disagreement on some of the things like making it easier for third party candidates to run for office, um, automatic voter registration, um, uh, uh, election security. So some of those things we did see um, some differences by, by political affiliation. And it tends to be that, that independence, um, you know, they, let's not forget about independence is mostly why I bring them up, but you know they they um, they are not they're not always falling when, when when we do see differences um, there are times when they they fall more to one side than the other um, I think we often kind of forget about independence when when we um, when we talk about polarization when we talk about political difference so um, and you'll see a lot of this detail for what we say. Thanks, David. And so uh, we have a question in the chat and then Brittany, I'll go to you. So uh, Mark Schleifler in the chat is saying, to what extent are you asking people about their feelings about the state of democracy when the democratic process delivers results that I disagree with? Do you have a sense of how alienation or feeling that democracy is in crisis or democracy isn't working ties to how people feel about the other side winning? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and, um, I don't entirely know the answer. I can, I would have to actually kind of look back at some of the data and see, you know, over the, over the years that we've been asking this democracy in crisis question, how well this correlates with just what political party is in power. Um, and I think there's, you know, if I, if I recall from that previous data, there's some correlation, but that doesn't explain everything. Um, but I do think um, it would be interesting to kind of um, ask some of that um, actually at a more kind of granular level, um, you know, like if there's like a, you know, I think there, there's a, that question at the sort of sort of federal level, but also be interesting to know, like, you know, if there's an outcome in your town on your community board that you don't agree with, how do you think, you know, could you nonetheless say that the process was a good process? Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's possibility there for people to have an outcome that they don't like, but to still say, okay, that it, it went well, and I can therefore accept, um, you know, how that process went and can accept. I was just going to add, so one, one thing is I'll note, there may be people on this call who know a lot more about uh, this particular question, uh, who should feel free to chime in if, if that's the case. I would say that, I mean, one of the things we've seen is that, for example, I'm almost sure I'm not looking at the numbers right now, but that the number of Democrats who think democracy in crisis ha is in crisis has continued to go up even after the 2020 election when Democrats, you know, won all three, uh, won the presidency in both houses of Congress, et cetera. It's not as if that led Democrats to see the crisis as receding. And for Republicans, the, the number has still gone up, but obviously that's not really definitive. So um, but again, the the whole like setting for this is so much higher than again than questions about how satisfied are you with how democracy is functioning than it was 25 years ago. I think it's just quite clear the numbers have gone up significantly among Democrats, Republicans, and independents, et cetera, um, in general. But but there may well be relationship with most recent election as well. Thanks. And I also wanted to flag, just in case we haven't shared this already, that the report will be coming out tomorrow, I believe. And I think people can access that from our website. It'll also be shared in various news outlets as well, just so you can dive in a little deeper. 
Um, okay, Brittany, you had your hand raised. Yes. Hi, guys. I'll pop on video for a second to say hi. Hi. Um, yeah, just curious what the demographics look like when you look at the politically alienated compared to gen pop. What really stood out to you in terms of who's over indexing where and, and who are the politically alienated? Um, good question. I'm going to have to kind of go back to the tables a little bit, which I won't be able to do um, so quickly. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that I was fairly struck by was just the, you know, the, the fairly even distribution across um, political affiliations. Um, but I think, you know, maybe, maybe it's a, I, don't know, let, let, I wanna kind of look at the data a bit and kind of kind of work up that picture. I mean, I know that when we, um, if I'm remembering correctly from when we were first looking at the data, it, there, there wasn't anything tremendously striking. I think we did see some differences um, by um, by education in terms of who felt more alienated, um, but it wasn't, um, you know, there was nothing that was sort of, there was nothing that we looked at in the data that was sort of like, ah, it's all about this group. Um, so good question. I think I want to take a look at the data and, and see what we can actually say definitively on it. Yeah, thanks, David. And then we have a question in the chat from Colleen. Are people in urban or rural communities feeling more alienated? Is there a marked difference? That might also require you to look into the data too. <laughs> That may also be something we can't answer, even if we look further in, right? Is that right, David, that we probably don't have? We, we do have urban rural as Oh, okay. There we go. Do, do we, I can read out a couple of comments while you're looking that up. How about that? So um, Chris is saying that when someone self-identifies as an independent, the follow-up question is always, which side do you mostly vote on? And what we know is that there are act very few actual independents. It's a brand that people like, but most self-identified independents vote one way or the other way consistent, consistently. And then Sarah Lee says, bringing up a really good point, it seems that in order for ordinary people to get involved or run for office at a state or federal level, lots of money is needed. So even if you get involved at a local level, it is hard to climb the ladder and get into state or federal. Uh, that leaves the ordinary person out, leading to a sense of alienation. I don't know if Andrew or David, if you had any comments on that. I want to make one point, because Chris is obviously absolutely right about the behavior of people who identify as independents. And I think one of the things for us, so if you're doing election focused polling, that's obviously a critical thing to understand is like, is the person I'm talking to really always a democratic voter such that if they were saying they were gonna vote for the Republican, that's a big deal for a candidate to understand or whatever, or are they somebody who is genuinely in that small group of Americans who are swing voters, et cetera. Because our polls are focused or our surveys are focused on other things, that is to say, we're not looking at the outcome of particular elections. The fact that people identify as not a Democrat, not a Republican, but want a different political identity, even if they vote one way most of the time, I think for us, we think of that as important in understanding the landscape. And also there's a large group of people who even those three labels they don't want uh, that we think of as unaffiliated. Um, and so as, you know, as David was saying, for us in thinking about the polarization landscape, when people think of it as being sort of defined by Democrats and Republicans, there's just a lot of people in the country who don't think of themselves as either of those things. And so in, in those sort of broader social dynamics of our polity, that it's an important category, but it's absolutely true, as Chris said, that most people in it have a typical way they vote. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. All right, James, you've had your hands up for a second. Would you like to share? Yeah, I, I just want to, I, I'm interested in getting deeper, especially on some of the alienation, because it sounds like, you know, a huge number of people are alienated, but probably some people are alienated because uh, of things like voting rights or January 6th or, uh, or the Electoral College. That's probably one whole cluster. And then there are other people who are alienated because they think, the uh, press doesn't fairly represent uh, what's happening, or they are concerned about the role of the administrative state, or uh, 
And I, I just, as you go deeper underneath it, you probably find more of more character around the disagreements. Uh, we all agree. I think it seems like almost all of us agree there's a problem, but we think for different reasons and therefore our solutions will be very different. Uh, and that's where the kind of structural change you're talking about probably will vary dramatically depending on what root causes people are talking about. So that's what I, I just, maybe the report will have much more detail on those root causes. Yeah. Is that right? Or I, I just can't I guess, hear you. I guess yeah. I would say, no, I, I think David and I were kind of looking at each other. Uh, I mean, one thing, and David can say more about what is and isn't in the data. I think one thing is, um, there, you know, we we used this three question index to identify who's alienated, partly because it is, um, you know, those three questions that we then asked everybody to answer at the beginning of this. Like that's a, a kind of uh, index that's in the literature um, that has some kind of foundation. But it's true that it does not get, therefore, more fine grained about what is the nature of kind of yeah the the sort of the underlying causes of that experience for different people. What has caused them to form the beliefs? That lead them to answer those questions in the direction they do. Uh, so, I mean, one one thing about that is I think there's a lot more research that could productively be done, um, and you know we'd love to do it. This is this is uh, for those who are or have been board members of Public Agenda, right? This is a resource question about uh, how deep we can go in in these surveys and how many more we can do to kind of dig down. I do think it was interesting. I mean, my impression of the the structural reforms or the changes, maybe some of them are clearly structural reforms, some are just changes of various kinds. And the fact that alienated, the folks who identified as alienated, or we identified through that index, basically, their answer to all of it was yes, like, let's change. And my sense was in seeing the data that people were not being especially discriminating about which of the reforms were most appealing to them. And of course, again, this is a group that answered that question about feeling like they didn't understand things very well, all in that same way. So these are not folks who feel like they have a really fine grained understanding and they know what particular tweak might make all the difference. They are people who feel like the whole thing is a mess and it's confusing. And when offered things that sounded like ways we might mix it up, shake it up, they were positive about it. And again, that uh, in some ways is frustrating because right, one would wanna know a great deal more. And I'm sure there is more to know if, as you said, we had the opportunity to kind of slice and dice this group in ways we haven't. But I also think it just generally paints a picture, not again of people who are like, well, I don't know what's going on out there, but it's fine. I'm just gonna focus on my own life. It's people who are saying, I feel like it's all kind of a mess and we need to change it. And nobody really cares what I think. Uh, and I think, again, that that's useful for us in a, just understanding what the the kind of valence of uh, this alienation is is kind of all about. Thanks, Andrew and David. Oh, sorry, I'll get you in a second, Sarah. Um, David, did you want to share a little bit more about what you said in the chat just for the people who aren't able to read the chat? Sure, yeah, so just, just briefly. So, um, you know, people who are alienated are slightly more likely to be younger um, women and not have a college education, um, but slight is the operative word here. So there, the differences are, they're there, but they're, they're, they're not, we're not talking about big differences here. Percentage points, statistically significant, but small. Um, we see no real differences by race, race ethnicity, um, no real differences by income, urban, rural, can't tell you right now because um, the rural sample is small and the rural Americans are, are relatively small in number and so small in the sample, um, but it's something I can sort of see if we can pull out. Great, thanks for finding that. Okay, Sarah, did you wanna ask something? Uh, well, I wanted, <clears throat> I wanted to make a comment because it seems that um, we're looking at this very uh, rationally, and I think because of the issues that have come up in politics, that emotional, personal issues have been used very, very wisely. And let me tell you, this started back in the 80s with the moral majority when Reagan started then. They have gently inserted 
uh, very personal issues into our politics in order to, div to divide us. So I don't think it is the system that needs changing. It is the, um, it is the rhetoric. It is the way we are living now. How do we change the conversation? I don't think the, si the system, I think, yeah, the, uh, the, electoral, the electoral college, I think probably needs to go. Uh, I think we need to get big money out of it. I think corporations are not people. Uh, but it's those types of reforms that those are small things in the system. It is the conversation that is built around our politics that's dividing us. And I don't know how you change that. I think, you know, how do you do it? And I don't think there's an answer to that. Uh, I think it takes time. Uh, and I think uh, from, you know, speaking from my point of view, I think we need to uh, uh, call out the other side and start being rational and getting religious and personal feelings out of it and just stick with the politics of it, being a civil servant, get out of my life. I think that's what people are looking for right now, get out of my personal life in so many ways. I think an interesting question. I think an interesting question is how systems influence the nature of rhetoric, public discussion, the kinds of issues that surface, et cetera. And I do think, again, one of the uh, you, you know, I always think that federalism is a think pe thing people like when they've lost the last national election, right? You, you like the idea that in some states you can experiment with the stuff you like, even if at the national level you can't. I do think this is a moment where seeing what might help at, at the local level, uh, seeing what kinds of process changes, system changes. You know, Dar was talking about participatory budgeting. If people feel like they have an active role in distributing the resources that are available to their community, does that change how they communicate with the people around them? I don't think we know very well. Uh, I think there's some indicators, whatever, but there's a ton more to be learned about how these kinds of changes. So, right, we can't you know, when you have free speech, then people get to say the things they want to say. But the question of what incentives they have to say different kinds of things may be affected by the structures you're working in. And so I think these are, uh, you know, these are the kinds of experiments that I think would be worth undertaking in particular states and particular localities where there's an appetite for it. And I also don't think these have a particular partisan flavor to them. I think uh, in many communities, Republicans might see advantages to shaking up the electoral rules, and in other communities, Democrats would see that. And so we might see some experiments happening in different places. Thanks, Andrew. And I was just going to give a very simplified response, which is that, um, you know, one of the things I try to do is break binary thinking. And I think Julia said in the chat, like rhetoric influences systems, systems influences rhetoric. So how do we kind of look at being able to change both? So I always think like both and. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So Julia, you have your hand raised. And then if anyone has a question after that, then we'll close. No, actually, hi. My um, Mine was more a response to Sarah's uh, point, which I, I really appreciated, um, David and Andrew's comment. So what I toss in the chat, one um, system change that may have an influence on rhetoric is moving towards systems that um, give incentivize talking to the other side and, and and working across divides. So proportional representation or in the US that would be multi uh, seat districts or ranked choice voting. I think many people are pre, uh, understand are familiar with that. Um, encourage politicians to to lower their rhetoric, their the divisive rhetoric because um, in order to speak to a wider audience. So those are two examples of systemic changes that could in theory, um, have a positive effect on rhetoric. Amazing, thank you. And we're also seeing a little bit of conversation in the chat, um, finding it really striking that there's no real differences by race. Um, and David is saying that the lack of racial difference on the alienation questions is striking. Even on the questions about democracy and crisis about the design and structure of the government, we don't really see much of a difference which is interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's really fascinating, David. I'm just wondering if 
you know, when you say something like democracy in crisis, that I think that means a different thing to a white person versus a person of color, as well as other axes of differences as well. Um, you know, because as we all know, the lived experience is just so different. So that's just something that really struck me is like, where is race in all of this? And I'll just say quickly, like when we look at the, um, the, I think where 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 the where differences by race do start to emerge is when we look at some of the um, things that we asked about about getting um, you know what would get you more involved in the political process and there we do see differences on some of the things that we asked about including um, making the voting process easier um, where more um, Black and Latino Americans are saying that that would get them more involved in the political process. Automatic voter registration, again, something that they people are saying would get them more involved. Um, those are the two that that stand out as as different. I have to take a look at what the, the problem responses are, but I do think that kind of points to, and I think this is something we could sort of dig into in future work, is like that kind of experience of democracy, that experience of dealing with democratic institutions and um, just the institutions of, of, of government and how those experiences um, may differ by race um, and to kind of dig into, um, you know, what the, the, the degree of trust that that may create or destroy. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's definitely more to be done here on those questions. Amazing. Thank you, David. And so we'll come to a close right now. Uh, thank you all for spending your afternoon with us, an hour of your afternoon with us. Um, the report will be going out tomorrow. And if you um, believe in the work that we're doing, you know, Public Agenda is a nonprofit organization. Um, we need the support from individuals like you to make sure that we're continuing our work on the engagement side and on the research side. So if you are able to contribute to our organization, we would certainly appreciate it um, to make sure that we can continue doing this important work. Great, thanks all. Bye. Thanks everybody. And the, uh, the report will be sent out to everybody. So we'll send a link to the report out to everybody who was registered for today. Thanks for being with us.